Ahora tu cuerpo es sacudido por pesadillas. Ya no eres el mismo, el que amó, que se arriesgó. Ya no eres el mismo, aunque tal vez mañana todo se desvanezca, como un mal sueño, y empieces de nuevo. Tal vez mañana empieces de nuevo, y el sudor frío, los detectives erráticos, sean como un sueño. No te desanimes, ahora tiemblas, pero tal vez mañana todo empiece de nuevo. I've done these videos for a while, and I often get asked about how I cope. How do I keep myself happy and healthy despite all of the horrors, despite all the oppression and suffering that I not only see around me, but that I try to study and talk about on this channel? Here's my response. I have recently decided to choose optimism without any compromise, without any doubt, at every opportunity. I refuse especially to let anyone from the Imperial core, from the US, the UK, or France, or elsewhere, or Canada, to tell me, after having been educated in blood-stained classrooms, about how a better world is impossible. That especially includes myself. Life has never rewarded me for hating it. Life has never rewarded me for hating myself. Hopelessness is not an option for people in desperate circumstances. Their survival depends upon their belief that they can get through what is in front of them and that better things can come, if not through the sheer will to catalyze their arrival, then merely through the uncontrollable cycles of birth and rebirth. Is this rational? It depends on how you define rationality. If rationality is an ability to predict what will come next, then perhaps a constant pessimism is more accurate, especially when focused on the obvious issues. Climate crisis is impending. Oppression and exploitation will continue. Interpersonal abuse will always be around the corner. But these are only accurate insofar as they are abstractions. The current state of these issues will most certainly change. As it exists now, oppression and exploitation will die. We know this better than we know it exists, because we know that everything which is born will die, that everything comes to an end. And of course, their deaths will more than likely come with a new round of oppression and exploitation for the future. Meanwhile, the oppressed, dependent on optimism, can have a clearer sense of actuality here and in the future. The oppressed know that every form of oppression ends. Every empire falls. Capitalism has existed for hundreds of years. The Holocene period alone has existed for almost 12,000. Serfdom ended, as we know it. The divine right of kings did as well. The oppressors of the past become oppressed, and vice versa. If the one thing we know about existence is that everything changes, and we know that right now things are not okay, then the only rational conclusion is that at some point in the future, things will be okay. And then at some point afterwards, they will be not okay again. And then they will be okay. And so on and so on until the end of existence, a thing which we can never know. But that predictive aspect is just one measure of rationality, and maybe not the most important one. After all, it's not like humans are very good at predicting the future. We have a hard time even seeing our own unraveling, our own decline with health issues, or our own relationships falling apart. So how are we going to consider ourselves predictors of the universe? The optimism of the oppressed is not more rational merely because it is more accurate about the cycles of life, but because it is more effective at adjusting and sustaining within them. Hope is necessary as a force for achieving tasks. A soccer player who shoots at goal believing they'll never score is more likely to be correct. Neuroscience is messy, but it tends to favor this observation, although with an important detail. A paper featuring multiple meta-analyses of neuroscientific studies on self-confidence finds that a sporting culture prizing confidence over everything as the key to success misses the forest for the trees. It's not that confidence has a proportionate relation to success, it's that a lack of confidence creates more and more windows for unsuccessful choices. Quote, the confidence-performance relationship is small in magnitude with a few important moderators. 
It might be true, as Carl Lewis asserts, that without confidence one cannot win. However, it might simply be that, without more confidence than the other team or competitor at a critical moment, one will find a way not to win. The more our soccer player believes that they're never going to score, the more choices they're going to make based on that disbelief. She's less likely to shoot with proper form, she's less likely to fully focus on the task of shooting, and perhaps most importantly, she's less likely to shoot the ball at all. And there you get the famous Michael Scott, Wayne Gretzky, Michael Jordan quote, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. The problem is that this is all a bit cheesy and, and triggering because this is the kind of stuff we get preached at us all the time to justify us doing things that we really shouldn't have to do, like hustle in order to get a steady lifestyle. And that's because these kinds of quotes and ideas are manipulated by the people that exploit us, which causes us to associate these ideas as such as being reactionary, as being wrong. But that doesn't mean the ideas are fully wrong. Exploiters will take any idea, good or bad, and use it to manipulate other people. This is how they co-opt movements in art and politics into cash cows. It's also how they inspire hopelessness. Once we can see that our truths, our human experiences, are by nature capitalist propaganda, then we can't even trust our own brains anymore. We have to resist that and reclaim our humanization. We have to reclaim the insight of our human intuition our sense that the things we want are worth working for, even if they seem impossible to gain, our sense that working together we do better, our sense that some things are worth giving up on just as some things are worth doing. If it has to be said, the reason it is important to rehumanize ourselves is because we are ultimately human. We will all experience mortality and we all deal with different faces of a shared human condition. If we stake our existence in things which are inherently dehumanizing, false things like the impossibility of change and the futility of action, then we will live a life of suffering even when change benefits us and action impacts us. We will struggle to notice how the efforts of heroes from our past have led to us having the things that we have today because we're under this false assumption that any such efforts are ultimately in vain. If you accept that your abuser is correct in saying that you are worthless, you will never end your abuse, even as he lies dead in front of you. If you refuse to accept that he is correct, an extremely difficult thing to do, then you will always have the strength to at least attempt to end your abuse. Your abuser wishes to rob you of your humanity so she can use you, like a thing. You must hold on to it, even when it's inevitably the only thing you can hold on to. Also, she's wrong. She's factually wrong. You are not worthless, and her aims are impossible. You will always be human, even when he refuses to treat you as such. And thus, to choose humanity is to choose the ultimate truth, even when it coincides with unspeakable suffering. It is to choose the only thing that's real. I recently came across a post originating in Tumblr and then screenshotted and posted on Twitter like, everything else these days, which proclaims the merits of ominous positivity. Folks lined up to coin their phrases for this newly minted concept. You will be okay. You have no choice. Everything will turn out fine. You, you cannot, cannot stop, stop it. I shared it and it seemed to resonate with a lot of you, but for some of you it seemed to be a new iteration of toxic positivity. Everything is good. Bad things are not bad. You'll be fine. But to me, I think this ominous positivity idea has some revolutionary aspects to it, at least for now, and at least until corporations get their grubby hands on it and turn it into some reason for you to buy a new Disney Plus package, at which point we'll come up with a new cool idea again. Remember, nothing is static, and nothing is true all the time. In this moment, I find this phrase true and powerful. I find great power in recognizing the fact that you will be okay, whether you like it or not, whether you feel it or not. To illustrate what I mean, I'm gonna get into a little bit of metaphysical stuff. It's gonna get deep, it's gonna get all over the place. Bear with me. Dualities are very useful constructs for understanding things. Dialectics are a useful way to understand the inseparability and necessity of the duality and how each of these parts necessarily use one to affect the other. In Buddhism, there is a particular conceptual duality which poses an absolute truth and a relative truth. Ironically, part of this is used to explain non-duality because 
is kind of a synthesis, right? You use the duality to explain non-duality. Non-duality is the sense that there is no self, right? So that even though I have a self, like this physical embodiment of me, in actuality, what is this other than a assemblage of other things, right? Like if you had a bicycle and you started taking apart pieces of that bicycle, like the front wheel and the seat, you would eventually have something that's not a bicycle. But at what point does it stop being a bicycle? Do you know what I mean? It's a sign. It's a label that's a sign. Even when the bicycle doesn't work with full functionality as a bicycle, to a certain degree, you could just say it's a bicycle without a wheel. But to another person, it would say that's a unicycle. But in actuality, what is the bicycle other than an assemblage of other parts? It's a wheel. It's two wheels. It's a seat. It's a handlebars. It's all these other parts. So then if it is a bicycle, then does a bicycle have any sort of inherent thing that makes it an individual bicycle that is completely untested or undoubted? No, not really. It's just a matter of assigning the combination of a number of different individual things, which in and of themselves, you can look at and say, well, each of those individual things are just an assemblage of other things. Like this handlebar is an assemblage of like steel with like rubber on it. But where did the steel get manufactured? Where did it come from? How did it get bent in that direction? Um, your personality is an assemblage of things that are out of your control too. Where did you get it from? Is something inherent to you? It's something that had no affect on it whatsoever? Or is it a combination of things that happened to you when you were young, the people around you, the inherent characteristics you may have inherited from your family, etc., etc.? Everything you have is from something else. And that thing that it came from came from something else. And nobody can trace an origin to anything other than just general life and existence. And that's non duality. Why am I talking about this? Well, Another form of this absolute versus relative truth is in the concept that everything is okay and at the same time, everything is not okay. As Daniel Burke puts it for the Zen Studies podcast, reality has two dimensions. Along the dependent dimension, our world is unequivocally full of greed, hate, delusion, and suffering, and any moral person should feel compelled to do something to make things better. Along the independent dimension, things are just as they are, and when we don't impose our expectations and preconceived notions on the world, it's a miracle anything exists at all. The two dimensions do not conflict with one another but are simultaneously true. The challenge is to be awake to and live in harmony with both dimensions without clinging to either one. I think this is important to understand why we end up in these depressive, self-defeating patterns of thinking that, politically, there's nothing we can do to change the world. Because in a certain sense, that is true. No matter what we do, how hard we work, no matter what we achieve, no matter what the people in the past have achieved, ultimately, you can always count on oppression and darkness to be there. And there's probably nothing we can do to completely root it out. Like, it's just going to be there, right? But I think that's ultimately not a valid reason to not have hope that you can achieve important things and even that you can achieve one day a cessation of all of the bad things. Maybe we can get there. Who's to say? How can we know? Meanwhile, what we're taught is that the things that are just are. They just exist. They've always been that way. Capitalism, it's just a natural end to everything. We got here for a good reason, and that's just the way life has to go, and you have no power over it. And also there are two genders that you have to utilize inflexibly, and anybody who doesn't fit within that spectrum are confused in some way. Then you also have the fact that some races of people are more civilized than other races of people, and etc, etc. These are lies. When Mark Fisher said it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, he wasn't speaking on a rational assessment of current affairs the way a lot of you motherfuckers seem to think he was saying. He said it's easier to imagine that, not that it's more likely. Capitalism is unnatural, and it will end. And I dare say that it won't take the world along with it. Whatever it kills of the world will be reborn in some way. Our goal is to understand this in our relative dimension and act to make things better with every breath we take, not under the impression that we will independently fix the world, but that we will, in following its cycles, exist more harmoniously with it. Capitalism is dying in front of us, and we have the chance to either prepare for change or become swallowed up by it. I don't mean this in the doomsday hoarder sense, necessarily, but this is what socialism is about. If we know a ship is sinking and we have time to get our things off of it, 
We need to recognize this reality and act on it. Start building your communes, start learning how to do regenerative agriculture, start learning how to do first aid, start learning how to cook cheaply and sustainably, start learning how to defend yourself, start learning other languages, start learning how to live without corporate entities, start reading pirate stories, less for entertainment and more for information. A lot of this video is going to sound a little bit mystical. But I'm not speaking from the position of a church or a monastery trying to convince you to donate or buy a book. I'm speaking from the perspective of a human talking about what I think this life is in my own experience. And my perspective will change over time, like everything else. I'm telling you, the least rational thing to believe about this world is that it will always be this way. Hope is often touted as the life force of resistance. A hopeless revolutionary is an oxymoron, supposedly. My standpoint is slightly different. I agree, but it depends on what you mean by hope. I consider hope to be an idea with many definitions, which for most people means some type of belief in a non-existent better world, which will exist in some type of perpetuity. We win the war and live happily ever after. This definition of hope, to me, is actually counter-revolutionary. Because what happens when we eventually achieve a political goal and then we have to reckon with some of the negative aspects of what we've achieved, not even to speak about the things that we didn't get a chance to fix? Will you have considered the effort even worth your time? My version of hope is one that has to do with facing reality, right now and always. Suffering will end and oppression will end just as happiness and equality will end. If you're not okay right now, you will be okay. And also, if you're okay right now, you will not be okay. Everything is in motion. Failure is always possible, and so is success. Every high has a crash, and every crash has a recovery. Even when you feel like you are stuck in one place, you're factually not. Your cells are constantly dying and being born at different speeds. Cells in your colon regenerate every three to five days. Your body is constantly changing and your environment is constantly changing. You might think it's rational and based to accept that nothing good will ever happen, that this is the way things will be, that will never make things better. We're all fucked. There was a person in 1400s Hungary who thought the exact same thing. Kingdom had been around for far longer than capitalism has been around by now. So it would have actually been far more rational to believe that it would never go away, that a peasant such as themselves could never have the nobility and strength of a John Hunyadi, and even if they were to resist order, they would only be greeted with death and shame. If you gave that person a bottle of Sprite, they'd have you executed for witchcraft. You are a human. Presumably. You can control very little and you have very little understanding or foresight into what impact your actions can have, but they can have some impact. You will suffer and die, but you will also live and feel joy. Now, you can either live harmoniously with your mortality and accept it, or you can use others as a means to prove your own permanence, your own superiority, your own immortality, which will always be unsuccessful. Using others in this way is exploitation. It's domination, and it's unsuccessful. So you're a bad person, and you fail. Double whammy. To be in tune with your humanity, to accept your mortality, is to resist exploitation. In Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is a book I will tell you about till the cows come home, Paolo Freire coins the term limit situation, or situations that limit humans. Fair. He's a little Promethean about how humans, unique from other animals, have the consciousness needed to overcome limit situations, but I get his point. He says, It is not the limit situations in and of themselves which create a climate of hopelessness, but rather how they are perceived by women and men at a given historical moment, whether they appear as fetters or as insurmountable barriers. And so, if I sound overly hopeful, you'll have to forgive me. I can't think of a more rational way to live. Hopelessness has, as rational as it is, gotten me in my head, without inspiration, stuck, nowhere. Hope connects me to my mortality. It connects me to the real world. Freire says, Hope is rooted in men's incompletion, from which they move out in constant search. A search which can be carried out only in communion with others. Hopelessness is a form of silence, of denying the world and fleeing from it. 
The dehumanization resulting from an unjust order is not a cause for despair, but for hope, leading to the incessant pursuit of the humanity denied by injustice. Hope, however, does not consist in crossing one's arms and waiting. As long as I fight, I am moved by hope, and if I fight with hope, then I can wait. As the encounter of women and men seeking to be more fully human, dialogue cannot be carried on in a climate of hopelessness. If the dialoguers expect nothing to come of their efforts, their encounter will be empty and sterile, bureaucratic and tedious. So in conclusion, if you want to know how I get by, how I'm able to take care of my mental health or stay positive while trying to learn about all the oppression in the world and feel like I can do very little to help any of it, then first I have to say that it is the very fact that I believe that my actions can do something that causes me to do these things, that causes me to study and learn and try to participate and be self-critical about how I participate. But more importantly, I don't get to be hopeless on behalf of the struggles of other people. I don't even get the right to be hopeless about my own because I don't get to choose whether you're going to lose or not. I don't get to choose whether you're human or not. Because you're human, because you have mortality, because things end and change, that means that it is utterly irrational to be hopeless. Because to be hopeless, in my mind, is to say that nothing will change and nothing could be further from the truth. Thank you to all of you for your input, positive or negative, constructive or destructive, whatever, through this year, within this project. Let's keep going. Also, hit join to become a channel member and support my channel. You get access to really cool emojis to use in the comment section, like this fire emoji or this tea emoji. Those come in handy when I do a live stream or when you're in the comment section of my community posts and my videos. This is now the part of the video where I shout out my channel members. The new ones since our last video will be Rai27 and Desire or Desiree G, as well as Emily Martinez and May Cross. Thank y'all. Have a great one. Let's keep going. Or else.